Jin Dobre, if that's correct. Um, so if it's okay, I will switch to English now. My Polish is still very limited. Um, I want to thank Igo uh, for uh, inviting us and uh, for showing me Warsaw. It's my first time in Poland and uh, hopefully not the last time. Uh, and we're also very happy that um, I see so many people are willing to discuss this issue of conditionality or structural adjustment programs. You might have heard in the past uh, the term Washington Consensus, that rings a bell. Um, well, what we, try, what we will present today or discuss today is it builds on the, the Washington Consensus and there's a lot of discussion on semantics, how we would call it. Some people would call it the Wall Street Consensus nowadays, but we'll get more into the detail later on. So first, um, I, I believe that Marcin already uh, uh, presented us a little bit. Uh, we're a network organization uh, <coughs> consisting of 47 member organizations, of which EGO is one. So we're very happy to have them on board. And we also have uh, partner organizations in Latin America and uh, Asia and Africa. So we dialogue uh, and we exchange information. And we try to reinforce this uh, because we think uh, that acting globally is of the utmost importance. Um, um, importance nowadays. We have a small secretariat based in Brussels uh, with 16, about 16 uh, staff, and we work on the following issues. Um, well, this is actually um, sort of um, a summary of discussions uh, of our annual conference, uh, where uh, Marcin and Jan were also present. And we try to summarize some of the discussions and, and uh, work areas that we focus on. Um, I'm not going to discuss everything, but um, there is sort of um, several causes to which financial situations and budgetary situations of, of countries can be precarious. Um, illicit financial flows is one of them. Um, I can go in more detail later on, but trade misinvoicing, which leads to significant outflows of revenue from countries. Uh, tax avoidance, which is the same thing, um, uh, it, it, will, it can lead to countries losing billions of dollars, euros, whatever you want to, even Zloty, then it would be billions probably. Um, but um, it, the problem is that there is no real um, transparency on what's going on uh, in this international uh, trade, especially uh, in the resource sector. Uh, so it's difficult to, to pinpoint the amounts, but there have been some high-level reports. I will just mention the, the report, which is commonly referred to as the Mbeki report, uh, which uh, focused on Africa, obviously, and if I get the number correctly, it's it estimated, because it, it are always estimate that the continent lose on a, day, on a yearly basis about $50 billion. Uh, so it, it's, it's about uh, very significant amounts of money. Uh, then there is the debt pileup. Um, the IMF uh, recently announced that two out of five countries, and again, uh, particularly in Africa, have, uh, are suffering from excessive debt burdens. And uh, a debt trap occurs when countries start borrowing and issuing bonds to pay, out all, to pay off older debt. So they become in sort of a vicious circle, uh, and that we would call a debt trap. Uh, and in, in the end, we see that, um, especially in, uh, from certain countries, we see an outflow of resources, both natural, material, and financial, while these countries still have um, a wide range of development challenges in front of them. Uh, so then, uh, we have discussed some of the solutions, or some of the solutions that are being put forward. Uh, um, structural adjustment programs and austerity measures, we will discuss this later on. Regressive taxation is one of them, and privatization of public goods and services. Um, I also heard blended finance, so I, I, I probably not go too deep into it. You mentioned it. Uh, yeah, one of our uh, participants called it a magic solution. So you put public money and private money together and all of a sudden you get billions to trillions. Uh, recent ODI research, the Overseas Development Institute uh, from the UK, uh, they have done some uh, quantitative analysis and there it appears that um, the returns or the rates of returns are much lower, uh, and especially in low-income countries. I don't have the, the accurate numbers, but it's about 
0, uh, not point, uh, 37 dollars uh, compared to on the dollar. So actually you expect lower returns, but this is what you ex would expect in a, in a low income context because it will take time for an investment to materialize and to generate financial returns. So to state that you would go automatically from billions to trillions can uh, generate some questions and also well, some issues that we say should be further researched. Uh, we have also studied some of the blended finance projects where we have questions around the development impact uh, because it cannot be proven and we have discussed with uh, governments um, from different uh, European countries uh, to account for the development impact and there we, we find that it's difficult to get all the data because if the private sector player is uh, heavily involved uh, it can invoke uh, the commercial secret and then obviously you won't get all the data that you would need for analysis. Uh, so this is from a, a public scrutiny perspective uh, problematic. Um, and there we, we can find that it results in, in, in further increases in inequality. Now this is a summary of the presentation actually. So I can round up if you want here. Um, <laughs> Um, we, we see that the World Bank and the IMF, uh, they, have, they have different roles, obviously. Uh, the IMF is the lender of last resort, so it will focus on fiscal and monetary policies. Uh, and we have seen uh, that they would focus heavily on what they would call fiscal consolidation and very restrictive monetary policies, which means that uh, you have to keep inflation down and also uh, in the f on the fiscal side you have to keep the fiscal deficit down. Uh, this is also something you, you could find in, in Eurozone countries, for instance, and uh, there's always the, the debate on how restrictive monetary or fiscal policy should be. Um, even recently when the uh, European Central Bank announced that it would uh, re restart uh, <coughs> quantitative easing, uh, it was Mario Draghi who then called, uh, actually he called upon member states to use the fiscal instrument to create uh, more economic growth. So actually this is the IMF's bread and butter, the fiscal and monetary policy. Um, but we also found find in the policy advice and the conditions uh, they put forward that they would also call for uh, privatizing uh, state-owned enterprises and targeting of social policies from a uh, fiscal perspective. But uh, we'll go into more detail uh, later on. Now the World Bank um, has a different role. It's a development bank, so it will try um, mostly through project finance to develop, basically, uh, and it sees a big role for uh, the private sector. Um, obviously, SMEs and local SMEs have a big role to play in, in development. Uh, and then obviously we as a watchdog, we question whether the, the policies uh, being promoted by the World Bank would actually support these SMEs or actually would lead to uh, a diversion of funds away from developing countries and towards uh, companies which are not located uh, in those uh, countries. So we see that the reforms that are being promoted, I heard the uh, maximizing finance for development approach, not sure if you mentioned it, Jan. Anyway, I'll go, I'll go more into detail uh, later on, which aims to promote uh, the private sector. Now, we have some questions. Uh, if you would have heavily financialized uh, solutions, uh, how you want to implement that in rural areas, for instance, in very poor, low-income countries, like, say, the Congo. Um, but I'll, I'll go, again, I'll go into more detail later on. Uh, another thing that the World Bank is very much focusing on is that countries get their financial management systems uh, uh, on point and their procurement systems, and they provide a lot of uh, technical assistance in, in this area, as well as uh, loan conditionalities. Then um, economic policy along the lines uh, of the IMF, uh, if the stabilization is, is a very important issue, and they also uh, invest heavily in um, yeah, um, uh, VAT uh, advice, which mostly means to uh, increase VAT rates and wage bill conditionality. 
uh, which I will also go into further detail later on. And, and one of the, the key areas in the role of the private sector, um, I haven't mentioned that, is the promotion of the PPP model uh, through loan conditionality and, and other advice, and also to reform the, the business climate. And I'll go into more detail, but this is based on the philosophy that is uh, being put forward in the Doing Business report, which is a very influential report. It started a few years ago, and um, it's being... Um, referenced in, in many development plans. However, <clears throat> there has been a, a, a review, an independent review, which questioned the methodology of this report. But again, more on this later on. And then there's agriculture, which is uh, increasingly becoming more important. Uh, the World Bank sees that many countries still have idle land to develop, uh, and they want to uh, assist countries in reforming their agricultural systems and their land laws. Unsurprisingly, this creates uh, some tensions on the ground. Um, and again, more on this later on. But we'll start off with the IMF. Um, so we, we have done a review of uh, loan programs approved in between 2016 and 2017. It does not capture all programs uh, that are running uh, in this period because the IMF uh, periodically reviews programs. So a country might, um, might have agreed a program in 2015 and might still be in that program as of today. Um, so uh, we looked at the countries that started in, these, uh, in this period. So I'll go to the technical stuff a bit uh, faster. So uh, the, the quantitative conditions per program are about nine. Um, I would say these are the most important ones. Um, because they call for uh, budget criteria, uh, monetary criteria, for instance, to, to keep inflation low and to, um, yeah, to, to, to keep your budget low as well. Um, and, uh, for instance, limits on, on external debt, etc., and on domestic borrowing. So these are actually the, the, they actually put the goalposts, the budgetary goalposts for a country. And, and I would say that this will have ripple effects on on uh, other areas. For instance, if a country has to reduce its deficit by 3% as part of an IMF program, uh, you might expect cuts also in social sectors and it might impact development as, you, as we have seen in, in the videos earlier on. Um, also expenditure ceilings, it's the same thing. They, uh, they limit or they, they set the goalposts basically. Um, structural policy conditions are about 18 per, per loan. Um, now, if we count the reviews, we get a higher number. Um, the reviews, as I mentioned, a loan is periodically reviewed every six months, more or less, and additional conditions can be lumped in. Um, for instance, in the, the, I'm, the Argentina program, which you will discuss later on this, this uh, afternoon, the first review, um, it, there was a, an, an additional disbursement of seven billion agreed between the IMF and Argentina. But with that seven billion, uh, they got a raft, a raft of austerity measures uh, connected to the money. So, um, what are the typical conditions, um, or the controversial ones? Because there are many more. Let let me focus on the controversial ones because they spur debate. Basically, uh, there's there's a lot of uh, talk on VAT reforms, and VAT the IMF sees it as a an interesting uh, tax because it's easy to collect. On the other hand, uh, there are many analyses that um, highlight the regressive nature of this uh, tax, although they are not conclusive, I must say, but most of them point to the regressive nature of VAT, and I think in the, the films you also saw that um, increases in VAT, they, they affect the, the purchasing power of citizens and um, well, they, 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 make the, they can uh, make the cost of living go up. Uh, targeted approaches to social protection. This is interesting. Um, this is actually also something that's being put forward by the World Bank. Um, the philosophy is laudable behind it. They say, well, you have scarce money, you should target it to the most needy. Um, now, there has been some academic research, but also research emanating from the World Bank itself, uh, stating that um, Around, I can get you the exact numbers if you're interested, but uh, around 90% of these programs have uh, exclusion errors of about 90%. So actually they miss 
by 90% of people they should target. So it is a very risky method to do social spending and not effective at all. Um, in, and also in line with the rights space approach in the SDGs that Marcin um, um, presented uh, earlier on, uh, universal approaches tend to be more effective to cover uh, all citizens. And um, there's one, one other controversial program but by the IMF where the, uh, the Mongolia had a universal child benefit system and the IMF uh, asked the country to reduce it. And the government was not so happy about this. And you see in the, the reviews that there's always this game, this push and pull game by uh, increasing the coverage from 60% of the children to 80%. And the government does not want that actually. And there you see that um, as we heard the academic earlier on, these conditions are highly political. Uh, these are not just bureaucratic exercises. They, are, they intervene in the political discussions in the country. Now, the wage bill, um, this is uh, also one of the most controversial conditions that are being implemented also by the World Bank uh, and by the IMF. Uh, so countries are asked to bring down their, their wage bills, and that might lead to uh, caps on salaries, uh, layoffs, but also in, in, in the, um, public services such as healthcare, uh, social protection, um, and uh, education. Uh, I believe also in Argentina there's been uh, plenty of public layoffs. Uh, so this is um, obviously very uh, controversial. So, um, um, a few highlights from the study. Uh, we found protests in, in 20 countries. Um, some of the countries, Kenya was in, in the sample, Jordan was in Egypt, we saw uh, videos uh, from these countries. And um, uh, 24 are repeat borrowers. Now, this is an interesting concept. I'll, I'll go more in, in more detail later on when we discuss briefly Ukraine. You see that uh, the, the here we come to the issue of debt. So um, a country goes to the IMF when its debt burdens are out of control and it needs uh, some form of assistance. The IMF have, has a debt limits policy which would state that it would not lend into a country where a debt burden is considered to be too excessive. Um, we have found that this debt limits policy is either not respected or not effective enough. Um, and the IMF, by its own its mission recently in its review of conditionality, has admitted that it should improve its debt sustainability analysis as well as its growth, growth projections. But uh, I'll, I'll go into more detail later on. Basically, it means that we see that many countries, they, it's sort of a revolving door around the IMF without uh, improving their, their debt burdens. So we, we think that uh, another analysis and another uh, approach uh, should be taken to um, relieve countries of, of these debt burdens and, and look to, to other approaches rather than conditional lending. Um, but again, um, we'll go uh, into more detail. And we find that the IMF is, is uh, focusing heavily on fiscal consolidation or austerity, um, which means budget cuts um, and, and uh, yeah, um, ra raising taxes across the board. There's an uh, important study um, done by ILO which expects that by 2020, if I'm not mistaken, two-thirds of, of all countries across the globe will be affected by austerity. And this uh, can have a stifling effect on economic growth, economic activity. So it is counterproductive if it becomes excessive. And there's a lot of uh, academic debate around this uh, um, high-level economists like Stiglitz and, and Krugman, they have uh, called out the, the ineffectiveness of austerity actually to reignite growth. Um, in, in Argentina, again, well, I've studied the case a bit. I'm sorry, I, many people look at Argentina nowadays. Um, we, we also saw that the loan program was unable to reverse the, the negative growth and it actually had to do with what is called the fiscal multiplier effect, uh, where the cuts, um, for instance, um, lower public spending uh, would also lower aggregate demands. Um, if you also have uh, public layoffs, you have less purchasing power, so you have less money going into local SMEs, uh, 
who then also go out of the business, uh, like happened in, in Argentina. And then again, you get the circle that should come back, which is tax revenue to um, authorities, which is also lower because you have lower economic activity. So it becomes a very difficult cycle to, to get out. And uh, so the austerity becomes excessive when it reaches that point. Um, so um, I'll perhaps, um, I've already discussed this. Um, yeah, debt service payments. Um, this is why we call actually to, to do um, a rights-based analysis of economic reform and, and, and um, debt burdens, basically. Um, in, uh, especially in Africa, where you see that um, debt service payments, they are crowding out uh, payments on, on health service, for instance. And that's just one crucial sector of, of achieving the, the SDGs. So we think that looking at debt burdens and debt payments and increasing interest rates is of the utmost importance if we are going to really tackle the SDGs. Um, we have done an analysis and there, I think I have the table here, yes, there it is. Um, now you see the countries in red, they are not all uh, from Africa, but this is the sample we, we studied. Um, you see where the, the, the amount is in red, there you see that debt service payments, they crowd out expenditure on health. Um, and you see that in, in some of the countries here, um, they, they still have severe challenges in, in terms of uh, health and, and health service delivery and improvement of, of health systems. Just think of uh, Sierra, Sierra Leone is, uh, is okay, sorry, but um, yeah, Gabon uh, is one where I will go into more detail. Um, and these, this data is uh, from 2015. Um, so actually we expect that the situation is worse now because there are more countries as uh, told by the IMF that have hit, uh, that are being considered in debt distress or are with a high debt burden. So, and keep in mind, this is just one sector. If you would add uh, education, then obviously um, in some countries like Jamaica, which is also an interesting case, by the way, then uh, debt service payments still crowd out uh, spending on public services. But we are producing a new research on this, and uh, hopefully we will get uh, some more data, uh, some more recent data soon to you. Um, so the knock-on effects on uh, public services, um, we had looked into Gabon. I'm sorry, I'm going to see if I... No, I did not bring this slide. So in Gabon, uh, the government... Um, had an austerity program with uh, the IMF. Uh, there was a review mission uh, by the IMF. The IMF stated that it was not happy with progress uh, by the country, so it said, quote, the government has to take corrective action. Uh, one of the corrective actions had an effect on health service because uh, doctors were, pay were put on cash vouchers, which means that they weren't paid until further notice. And, um, people from the public health insurance that were insured by public health insurance were no longer served because the government had arrears in paying out the hospital. So this led to queues in hospital and hospitals and people uh, not being treated. In Chad, a similar story. Um, I'll, I'll not go into detail. I can, can share more detail later on. But there, um, austerity... <coughs> led to the cuts in, in straightforward cuts in, in health budgets. Um, again, Argentina, I'm sorry, um, there was an Argentinian, Argentinian research institute that estimated as a consequence of the austerity that's currently going on, uh, the health budget of 2019 would be cut by 8% compared to the 2018 one. So that's uh, very significant, I would say. Now, the IMF is aware of these uh, negative effects, so that's... Uh, a step in the right direction, uh, and they have uh, put forward social spending flaws. So we have <coughs> analyzed these spending flaws, but it appears that they, are, they lack ambition, basically, um, because they are at levels what is below, in the low-income countries that we analyze, uh, analyzed, it's, this is only an analysis for the low-income countries uh, where we analyzed how it matches with uh, guaranteeing basic health care, and there we see that these spending flaws are too low, um, let alone other uh, social spending or uh, other contributions to the SDGs. 
So, um, Argentina. Uh, I'll, perhaps I'll, I'll, I'll not go, I'll, I won't go in too much detail because you will have another speaker uh, in the afternoon. But um, Argentina went, they had, a, they had a strain, or they have a strained relationship with the IMF. It's no longer in the past currently as well. It's, it's becoming very difficult. Uh, a difficult uh, balancing exercise for the IMF. The reason for that uh, bad relationship is the 2001 crisis, uh, where many citizens and analysts uh, found that the IMF policy advice was, was partly responsible for uh, aggravating the crisis. Um, over years, um, the Argentine, Argentinian debt pile was also being bought up by what is called vulture funds. I'll, I'll briefly explain. Uh, so basically these are um, investment firms that uh, buy um, debt of crisis countries on secondary markets at low prices. But then when there is um, a request for restructuring this debt, they want to be repaid in full. So the full value of the, of the debt. And um, this, well, in, in the Argentinian case, there are uh, profit ratios of these countries that are three figures. So uh, the estimates, it's like estimating illicit financial flows is pretty difficult, but um, basically it meant that the Argentinian government, um, the new one, uh, agreed to pay out the, the vulture fund. So it needed to initiate more borrowing. So it created a new borrowing boom. So again, uh, the financial situation deteriorated. Um, before I go any further, there are ways, actually, there's, there's, there are two countries globally, if I'm not mistaken, Belgium and the UK, that have some legislation, excuse me, on vulture funds, um, where a vulture fund is only allowed to get back uh, the, the principle on what they bought, or the value what they bought, the, 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 the debt on the secondary market with a modest markup. Uh, because profit margins are, are really out of control. I believe it's up over 300%. So um, at some point, uh, the, the, the crisis in Argentina re-emerged and the government turned to the IMF. Uh, the peso was devaluing dramatically. Inflation uh, went through the roof and they reached out to the IMF for a significant bailout loan. As I already mentioned, it was raised uh, and it came with uh, strict monetary conditions and austerity measures. So typically budget cuts uh, at federal and provincial levels. Uh, Argentina is a federal state, so the provincial levels, the contributions or the transfer to the provincial levels were also reduced. And in many states or in many cases, provincial level is or are responsible for providing health care, for instance. So again, this affects uh, public uh, service uh, provision, then the wage bill reforms, pension reforms, which also um, well, basically put a ceiling on, on, the, uh, on paying out pensions. So it's also an austerity measures. Uh, subsidy elimination for sensitive products. So uh, the cost of living went up in Argentina. Uh, they have also been protesting quite a lot against that, if you have followed the news. Um, and, well, there are many more, but um, just um, let me look a bit more into what happened uh, later on. So, um, the IMF, um, like in Greece, they had very optimistic growth forecasts. They, but must say, in the case of Greece, it wasn't only the IMF, the, the Troika was involved as well. Um, and there they had very optimistic growth forecasts and um, debt projections. Uh, while the fiscal multipliers were also in, in Greece underestimated, so uh, the, the social situation in the country also crumbled gradually, as well as the economic activity. Um, the, same, the same happened in Argentina, uh, where actually the the debt limits policy arguably was was not respected, uh, where actually uh, before an IMF financing could be triggered, actually uh, there should have been talks about debt restructuring, because otherwise it's lending and, and making a situation worse. Um, so the government uh, recession was uh, was aggravated uh, through uh, uh, this down this lower economic activity, which led to a uh, negative GDP ratio, which in, then again 
worsens your debt to GDP ratio. So actually, it's <laughs> counterproductive from a debt sustainability standpoint. So um, th there were ways um, that we say as Euro that we should have looked at the debt burden first before lending um, blindly into into this situation. So um, the government, and this is more recently, uh, they, they were trying to curb the hot money flows. Um, so actually, people were dumping their assets in pesos, and they were burning through the external res reserves. And we have uh, also from Argentinian research, I can get you all the sources if you're interested, that about three quarters of the money uh, from the IMF went directly out uh, to bailouts and well it led to the formation of these external ac assets which were then used to um, well, to stabilize the peso but actually served also to bail out uh, people that were dumping <coughs> their um, peso assets so um, in all of this um, there, there, there have been also some uh, uh, statistics on poverty rates which in uh, 2016, uh, Argentina saw a 6% increase. Uh, in unemployment, I have um, data is a bit more wobbly, but it went gradually up. But right before 2018, it was very high as well. But from the onset of the crisis, it went gradually up. It went down a little bit, but it went up as well. So I already mentioned uh, cuts in social services and also local SMEs, they closed down uh, by the thousands. So then uh, to illustrate how, how countries can, can also get in sort of a lending trap, um, basically it was Jan who said, we will, dis we will discuss Ukraine. I'll, I'll say, okay, I'll, I'll have a look into it. Uh, and um, from just from 2010 to now, they had a 15 billion loan, a 17 billion follow-up loan, another 17 billion follow-up, and another 4 billion follow-up loan. So basically the... Well, the, 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 the prescriptions were the same, fiscal consolidation, reducing inflation, and also financial sector reform, plus uh, uh, a whole rift of uh, structural reforms on, on various areas. But it did not critically solve the, the, the financial situation of the country. Now, I must state that Ukraine is clearly a vastly different country than Argentina, which Ukraine had its share of political and security crisis in the, the last few years. So clearly another approach is needed for this country as well. And that is one of our main, um, um, yeah, main uh, recommendations to the international financial institutions rather than getting these general standardized policy prescriptions to look at the local context and to see what type of monetary policies are adequate for the context and what type of fiscal policies are adequate in a certain uh, country context. So the bank. Um, well, um, as I mentioned, the bank, is its main portfolio is project finance, but it also does what is called development policy finance. And with this money, it's actually giving a country a loan to, um, well, to perform some policy reforms. And as we will see, these are basically focused on private sector development um, or attracting private investment, I would say. Um, so uh, we looked at 53 operations in 46 countries of 2017. Uh, um, 30 operations were in IDA countries. These are the, the low income countries and IBRD countries are upper middle, lower middle incomes. So. The number of conditions is, is vastly lower as compared to the IMF, but so is the funding. So the, one of the, the largest um, World Bank loans recently was again to Argentina uh, of half a billion, and that's there. But they do several loans and several uh, project uh, finance. So it's actually, you should look at the whole portfolio. Um, so the World Bank also has this development policy retrospective, its review of its lending. And they have certain categories that they apply, but um, we have actually uh, done our own analysis and looked at the conditions and labeled them ourselves. Because, um, for instance, and which is okay from their perspective, the World Bank has a category energy uh, and, and climate. 
And we found that a lot of these uh, conditions related to the energy sectors were actually promoting PPPs in, uh, in provision of uh, electricity, etc. So we labeled them as private sector development. Um, so um, as I already mentioned uh, earlier on, um, economic policy and agriculture are also very important. So uh, these instruments, they, they advance policy and institutional reforms which uh, are in tune with, with wider World Bank agendas or other uh, World Bank agendas. One of the most famous ones is the Maximizing Finance for Development. I'll briefly explain uh, what that is. It's sort of a, a cascade approach. So uh, can commercial finance do it? Then let commercial finance uh, um, take, the, take, the, take the lead. Um, then if there's not enough commercial finance, then put the reforms in place that they can do it. And then there's also the de-risking uh, of um, private investment, which <coughs> firstly goes to MIGA, which is uh, another uh, branch of the World Bank. And then in the end, there's only the, the public uh, sector that is being put forward. Now, obviously, um, if you heavily invest in, in private services and financialization, you will have some tensions with public service provisions. Just think of education and health where you would need public resources basically because there's very little profit for commercial finance in this sector. Health is a bit different but in education. Uh, even though there are more and more commercial schools being developed and the World Bank is also supporting these, but at the same time, the, there's a, a general need in some low-income countries to broaden the base and actually make sure that there's more public service provision so that all children, uh, boys and girls, can go to school. Um, and one other thing with uh, the creation of uh, or um, the privatization of public services is that they, they might ask user fees and those will be impoverishing for people that are already poor. So actually having to pay for healthcare or education um, is uh, very difficult. The WHO uh, has labeled um, user fees or, well, spend, expend, not user fees, but expenditure on, on uh, healthcare as one of the most crucial elements uh, for people to fall into a poverty trap. They call it catastrophic health expenditure. And I have also uh, various estimates on this, but I'll, I'll, uh, I can get you more info on this. So the other agendas are uh, the Doing Business Report, um, the Enabling the Business of Agriculture, and also they work uh, back to back with uh, the IMF. Uh, to get a World Bank loan, you must prove that you have a sound macroeconomic framework, and for this, uh, it has to, a country has to have an IMF seal, either a program or uh, good advice to a surveillance mission. Um, <clears throat> so we see that there's more and more of these operations, development policy operations taking place, which can take the form of grants, lending or, or uh, credits. Uh, diagnostic tools are also very influential. We're currently uh, developing research on this and there we see that there's a, a coordinated push to to privatize certain sectors. And um, as I mentioned before, it's, it's all about do these initiative, uh, initiatives actually reach the local SMEs? And there we see that basically the IM, IFC is uh, creating um, the floor, or preparing the ground for more um, external uh, private sector investments, which do not necessarily contribute or not to the same amount to the local economy. Um, so, um, as we mentioned, a quarter of all conditions is uh, the enabling or the promotion of the private sector. Uh, we see a lot of regulatory reforms, uh, PPP laws, privatizations, uh, the energy sector, uh, increasing uh, access for uh, companies in the <coughs> energy sector, and the MFD approach, the Maximizing Finance for Development approach. We also had three countries, which are the pilot countries for MFDs, uh, which also already had uh, DPOs in place, which are in line with the wider uh, strategy, 
which links not only development policy operations, but project finance, guarantees, technical assistance, and advisory services. So it's actually the philosophy behind the MFD, which is pushing the countries into a certain type of reform. And then uh, we obviously uh, raise the question, and not only ourselves, we have partners in Jordan as well, to what extent does this respect uh, aid effectiveness principles? in particular democratic ownership of uh, development policies. So um, there's a concerted push uh, by the bank to implement this approach using all of the instruments and tools it has at its disposal. So uh, of this private sector agenda, there's um, uh, a good share which are reforms which are in line with um, the Doing Business Report. So uh, the Doing Business Report is published yearly and it praises or uh, does not praise countries for their advances in, the, in creating the business climate uh, or improving the business climate. Um, <clears throat> so um, in Albania is one case where uh, the country was lauded for its advances in reducing the time for construction permits and access to electricity. Now it appears this was not... The World Bank, um, in our discussions with political staff, they, they say, well, it's a, a knowledge product and it's free of any form of constraint. Well, we found in the, the, the loan to Albania, the review of or improving the issue, issuance of construction permits was a policy con or the loan conditionality which makes it less free of constraint. Um, so... Here we mapped the different uh, conditions along the, the different indicators of the doing business report. It's for the very nerdy persons like myself who can uh, have a look. Um, similar, uh, the enabling the business and agriculture agenda. Um, this also, um, the World Bank wants to, yeah, um, actually it's to, to improve the agricultural sector uh, and to improve agribusiness uh, in, in those countries. And uh, there we see that land reform is crucial, uh, agricultural trade and market finance, seeds and fertilizers, etc. Uh, but let me highlight the land reform. This, um, if you look in, in Africa, there are different types of land systems. You have an official one, a customary land system, etc. So. Uh, steering such a reform from abroad uh, is creating a lot of tensions on the ground and uh, this has resulted in quite a lot of controversy. Um, there are a few organizations that have been highlighting cases but uh, Sierra Leone I think is one of the, the cases in the spotlight right now where you would see that uh, property rights and in particular for women, uh, cannot be fully captured by a, a loan conditionality which is being engineered from Washington because you would need really localized uh, solutions. Um, so um, the Doing Business Report, I, I'd like to zoom in on this because you know that we have been working quite a lot on this and uh, we have had uh, discussions with uh, the World Bank executive directors and there's some acknowledgement on, on, on a, of our concerns, but their key thing for the Doing Business Report, it's, it's a policy icebreakers. When they, when they engage in discussions with countries, they see it as um, an easy way or a standard approach to uh, discuss reforms. So this is one of the, I would say this is a summary of the key concern, basically. Um, this was an independent review panel, basically with uh, um, academics from a wide range of, of countries, headed by Trevor Manuel. And, but this is a, a criticism you can put to any ranking method, right? You, you try to bring together a vast amount of information uh, and you try to summarize it into a single number. Now, the main problem with this is that there's a a value judgment in, included in this doing business ranking. It is, um, it, it will tell you what is good for business. And if you look at the, the respondents and the country level that are, that are putting or providing inputs uh, to this report, you see many, you see branches of big firms that basically are not, for instance, African, but uh, 
from uh, other countries, developed countries, uh, who will then steer with their branches um, well, the input, and then you get standardized reforms which might work very well for Western countries, but which are completely disconnected with the reality of SMEs on the ground in Africa or uh, in other low-income countries in Asia. So there is acknowledgement of the methodological flaws, and there was recently a controversy with Chile where you saw the rankings jumping up and down, uh, and then the president, then President Michel Bachelet, spoke out to that, uh, and well, the I don't know. They have sent a review panel. I'm still waiting for the report of of that one. Uh, so we will see what uh, what comes out of this one. Um, what is uh, interesting, the most controversial indicators was one the labor indicator, uh, which is um, currently no longer part of the the overall aggregate ranking but which is still being counted. And what is counted in the labor uh, indicator is basically the, the issues we heard by the professor in the video, which is labor market flexibility. Uh, then the other thing, uh, the other controversial indicator is uh, paying taxes. Um, and there, even though the indicator would not count for it, uh, it, uh, it talks about the ease of paying taxes. And there we see that uh, countries with lower corporate tax rates tend to be higher up the ranking. So it also um, actually shows a certain preference for what type of taxes a, a country should uh, apply. Um, and then, yeah, indeed, all the other regulations on business registration, all of it is about to, to harmonize it and to make it more quicker, etc., which from a business point of view, you could understand, but um, if you have to make sure that all, that a country or as they see fit could implement their, uh, um, sorry, I'm looking for the word in English, aménagement um, public, sorry, the, the, the environmental concerns and everything you need to build a building, that they can respect it and that they can respect their own regulations and are not being put under pressure to deregulate from Washington again. So um, also the, the report has a bias for uh, SMEs uh, in cities, uh, which is, well, uh, I know Africa a bit, so I, I know that cities are quite different from uh, rural areas and informal settings there. Mm -hmm. So you would have significantly different advice, but still the, the report advises the same thing across 180 or 19 countries. So. Um, so, as I mentioned, it conflates the challenges faced by SMEs in high-income, middle-income and low-income countries. So, a business environment, my main point is a business environment in Poland or the, the ideal business environment of Poland would look different from the ideal business environment in Benin, just to say an example. Um, so, um, then we come to the alternatives or uh, critiques. So I believe it was last week, um, the UN independent expert on foreign debt and human rights um, was also pushing for a rights-based approach to um, economic reforms and the, the policies of international financial institutions. Um, he linked the austerity push by this institution and also the privatization of public services to human rights impacts. And he calls for, um, for, for these institutions to be held account. Um, and he has put forward a few tools, which you would call the UN Guiding Principles um, on Human Rights Impact Assessments of uh, Economic Reform. So the idea is that each country would have an independent uh, human rights institution, which would um, produce regularly uh, human rights impact assessments of the economy, of economic reforms, and would... Uh, and bring this forward uh, regularly to the government in all stages of the planning cycle. So before decisions are made, during the implementation, because during the implementation certain adverse effects might emerge, emerge and also exposed, so that you get a full view of what the impact is on the human rights. Now, I also must clarify that here we talk about a, a holistic view of human rights. Uh, it's not limited to uh, I would say the political uh, 
human rights, which means um, uh, freedom of speech and, and freedom of assembly and those sort of things, but broader rights, uh, rights to, um, to a decent living, decent housing, right to health, right to education, etc. <clears throat> so um, the, the idea is that these, um, these impact assessments uh, could shield the poor from uh, structural adjustment and austerity. So actually what the, the idea is behind these impact assessments that if it can be uh, demonstrated that it will have um, a negative impact on a certain group that you would opt for less harmful uh, alternatives uh, if they are available. So basically it's trying to bring the economic reform agenda in line with human rights and right-based agendas like the SDGs. That's actually the, the idea that's behind it. So um, as I summarized, um, it should be an integral part of the policy planning cycle, decision-making, negotiation, negotiation processes and official working, working methods between uh, the international financial institutions and the borrowers. Um, we also would like the debt sustainability analysis, which now exclusively looks at economic indicators, which has one part of the story, obviously, but we will also want to include this um, perspective, for instance, in, in, in debt sustainability analysis. For instance, how much, how does it compare the, the, the debt service payments of a country to uh, its provision of social services or public services? such as education. So uh, this is from um, a direct copy from an ILO report. Um, so there are various alternative uh, methods and we can discuss each of them. Uh, and within those methods, we also have different views. I mean, we can have expansionary uh, fiscal policy, but it will depend on the country context to what extent it should be expansionary. Um, so increased aid and transfers uh, is one, increasing tax revenues, and then obviously we'll have to see what type uh, of tax revenues you are creating. So a good one would be eliminating Ill illicit financial flows because it would put a lot of money in government's coffers again. Um, yeah, debt, um, debt discussions should take place uh, at Eurodebt. Uh, I think Machin will have mentioned this uh, perhaps in his talk. We have been... Uh, advocating for an independent debt workout mechanism in the line of uh, a bankruptcy regime in, in other sectors where we would look at the country's debt and uh, preemptively uh, try to restructure it. It's not the same as, as um, relief. In certain cases, relief might be granted as well, obviously. Um, then uh, a more accommodative uh, macroeconomic uh, framework to have some uh, inflation because... Uh, it was uh, mentioned there as well, the, the typical advice by the IFIs or basically by the IMF, uh, as one scholar who calls it uh, the inflation obsession, is to raise interest rates uh, to keep inflation down basically. And when you have repeat programs, interest rates stay so high that governments are prevented from uh, borrowing to invest in, in public service provision or to uh, build infrastructure, but at the same time, uh, local companies, they also face these high uh, interest rates. So um, if it's repetitive, this uh, inflation obsession, then uh, it, it also puts a dampening effect on economic activity. Now, there is an academic discussion, and uh, it's a very rich one, but um, uh, there's one a scholar who made a mapping of it. There's no ideal rate of inflation. Uh, there's a lot of discussion around this. Uh, and and my, my take on it is we'll have to look at the country to see what's, what's good for the country, basically. Uh, but, I mean, uh, estimates vary widely. Um, as you know, the Eurozone, it's 2%. And now, uh, since Europe is also moving into recession, at least certain countries, uh, there's also discussion, is this not too restrictive for the Eurozone area? Um, reallocating public expenditures, um, fiscal and foreign uh, exchange reserves. Um, I'm not sure if I have the time for this, but uh, um, I can just mention that US dollar uh, is actually a great insurance policy for the American Treasury. So all countries hold reserves in dollars, which is basically to the benefit of uh, the USA, but not so much uh, 
for other countries. Um, but anyway, we can can go into more detail. And social protection, look at uh, universal schemes. Uh, and that's the end.